It was a day like any other. The only things keeping me company were the four walls surrounding me and the crippling existential awareness of my own existence. And then, she walked into my office. She was a full-figured dame, like me. In fact, she was a lot like me. The difference being in her colors. That combination of pink and white and that blonde hair were almost the exact opposite of my aesthetic. She seemed lost, like a little bunny rabbit going down the wrong hole, now searching for her way out. What was she searching for? Perhaps a purpose on this floating rock we all live on. Or maybe, maybe something God, more- God, like, why is it so dark in here? Oh, shit! Emily! I was doing a bit! Oops. Like, sorry. I didn't know. <sighs> it's, it's fine. Ooh, are you still totes wiped after the other day? What are you talking about? You know, with like that funky van you took and those totes uber cool people you snatched up. Not to like mention the stolen van. You already mentioned that. I did? Like, OMG, I'm so totally forgetful. Yeah, you are. And I love you for it. Anyway, you got the thing I asked for. Well, Ovs. Good girl. Now leave me to my work. Okie dokie. Black Sad Under the Skin is an interesting game. See, how I found out about this game is one of the most oddly specific stories I have about discovering a game. Which is saying something because I have a lot of oddly specific stories about discovering games. Okay, so this is a website called Behind the Voice Actors. And a couple years ago, I was looking at the voice actors for a show I had watched as a kid called Code Lyoko. So it turns out the character of Ulrich was voiced by someone named Barbara Ann Weber Scaff, which is a really long name. And looking into her career, I found out she also played Carla in Indigo Prophecy, Fahrenheit for some of you. Why on that game's page, I found out that Lucas, one of the central characters of that game's plot, was played by David Gassman. Now obviously, that sent me down a rabbit hole of his career, and that let me discover he played a character named Boris in a game I had never heard of called Yesterday. Of course, the next step for me was to do what I always do when I discover a game I've never heard of. And at 1 in the morning, I looked up on YouTube the game's name and found an entire long play of the entire title. Turns out, Yesterday was a 2012 point-and-click adventure game from this company called Pendulo Studios. Discovering them led me down a further rabbit hole where I had to look into Pendulo's track record and found that they had quite a list of games, including their most famous games, the Runaway Trilogy. Fun fact, Runaway 2 and 3 have DS ports, which I find immensely funny, because not only does one not get a DS port and never had one, meaning if you were only playing these games on DS, you missed out on the first game, but Runaway 2 is apparently really despised by the Runaway community, and a lot of fans don't like that game, including Pendulo, apparently. Now the part of this rabbit hole that's relevant to today's conversation is that this led me to discover that, at the time, Pendulo was at the cons was at the point in their life where they were working on a game called Black Sad Under the Skin. As I'd come to learn, was a licensed game based on a series of graphic novels. The comics, without giving away too much, take place in 1950s America. They're a series of film noir style detective comics, with the catch being that every single character is a furry. Anyway, the Black Side comics were written by Juan Diaz Canales, I'm probably saying that name wrong, with excellent art from Juanjo Gurindo. I really apologize for my pronunciations here. Now, while the creators are Spanish, the comics are primarily French, with the Spanish translations usually being published about a month after the French versions. Pendulo Studios is located in Madrid, which is the capital of Spain. So, I assume that might be the reason as to why they were contracted to make this game, but that's just an assumption. Another thing I found out when looking into this game is that it's apparently not really canon to the comics. Juan and Juanjo were only consultants for the game, it didn't actually write it. That means you don't have to read the comics to play this game. I will say, getting a hold of the comics in English is super easy. Dark Horse published the first three issues into one big book, as well as all later comics into their own collective books. You can buy almost all of them physically on Amazon, no problem, if you're interested. If the noir detective furry comic sounds interesting to you, I'd suggest go giving them a read. I own the first three books via this method, and I really like the comics. The art is great, the writing is great, the setting is great, they're really good at building atmosphere and making you care about characters. 
Black Sad is right up there with Beastars as probably my favorite piece of furry content to exist. Now, Black Sad Under the Skin, the game that we're discussing today, based on those comics, is a mature rated game. Which makes sense, the comics are also very mature adult comics. I'm mentioning this now because I feel like since it's an M-rated game, I should probably preface that before continuing further. I'm also mentioning it now for a content warning. You know, this game includes the obvious film noir type stuff. You know, murder, sex, there's suicide implications. That's how the story begins, actually. Also, a reoccurring theme in this game is racism. It's 1950s America. Unfortunately, that was very common back then. Point is, the game's not only a mature game, but it has a lot of sensitive subjects. More than the usual sex and violence stuff you'd expect from this kind of thing. And I want to preface that now, for the comfort of my viewers. Enough of the introduction stuff, I should probably get to the actual game itself. Under the Skin starts with a woman finding a man's body hanging in the middle of a boxing ring. This man is a cat known as Joe Dunn, who owns the gym he was found dead in. Unrelated, but around this point in playing it, I started to wonder how popular boxing was in France, given that both this and Last Man have very big focuses on boxing. Last Man is also a French comic you should really read, and it has a more boxing focus than this, but I thought I'd bring it up. I like boxing personally, big Punch-Out fan, so I'm not complaining, but it was just a thought I had and I wanted to share it now. When else was I going to get a chance to tell anyone to read Last Man? Anyway, back on the plot, after that opening scene, the game cuts to an office of our main protagonist. This fine specimen of cat human is John Blacksad, a private eye who's currently dealing with an unfaithful rhino who is not happy Blacksad here has pictures of him getting some action with a woman who is not his wife. Cue easy quick time event that ends with Johnny Boy decking rhino here clear across the face with a typewriter. This rhino actually is a rhino named Eugene Colbert, by the way. I say that now and not later, so I can stop calling him Rhino, because that just makes me think of Spider-Man, and that makes me want to play Miles Morales again, and I need to focus. Now after a quick time event, you are given the first real choice as a player in this narrative. Eugene offers you a bribe to not reveal to his wife that he's not exactly the most loyal animal in America. You can take the bribe and keep a secret, refuse the bribe and not keep a secret, or do what I did and refuse the bribe but also keep a secret. Before you start mocking me like my mother did, let me just tell you, I have my reasons. I overthink everything, and my mindset is that maybe if I don't take the bribe and still help him, he'll come back later in the plot and give me a hand. Whether or not he does, well, that's up for everyone else to find out. But that was my mindset in the moment. And given that timer during conversations, I didn't exactly have much time to mull over the possible outcomes. If you haven't noticed yet, Pendulo's game has gone for the Telltale style approach, as opposed to a more traditional point-and-click adventure game. You know, stuff like choices changing the course of the story, quick time events that are pretty easy for more fast-paced sections, and dialogue-heavy gameplay with puzzles sprinkled in. A modern style point-and-click adventure game by all accounts. I actually like this style, admittedly. I'm nostalgic for games of this genre, and my love of detective media being mixed in with this gameplay style means the game already had my attention from the start. Honestly, it's been a hot minute since I've played a game like this, and not a lot of them are super mainstream anymore. Unless you're a Telltale or Don't Nod game. Those are kind of like the only companies that make these type of games that people actively pay attention to. My point is, don't go into this game expecting gameplay to be the focus. It's a lot of walking back and forth, talking to NPCs, piecing together evidence together via Jonathan Joestar's thinking powers, which is a key part of the gameplay I should probably get into. Basically, Johnny Blaze here can go deep into thought where you can piece together multiple pieces of evidence to come to a conclusion. It's actually important to progress the game's plot, and there are parts of the game that cannot move forward until you do this. I can go into a bit more detail on the senses part of gameplay later. I'm still in the middle of setting up the plot, actually. So, back on track, after you make your choice regarding Eugene, he leaves and Johnny B. Good is left alone for a brief bit before his old buddy Jake comes walking in with a fine kitty cat who has a case for our fine kitty cat. This is Sonia Dunn, daughter of Joe Dunn, who comes and brings Johnny Bravo into the case of her father and the disappearance of Bobby Yale, who has an important fight coming up that could determine the fate of Dunn's gym. That's the setup of the game, and from there, you must help Johnny Quest in uncovering the mystery and doing all the detective stuff you expect from a story where the main protagonist wears one of those tan detective coats that all the detectives seem to own. All of them. You know the one. Don't lie to me, you know the one. From this point forward, I'm not going to really explain the plot. The plot does evolve past that initial setup, 
characters are revealed, things happen, twists and turns, the whole nine yards. But since it's such a story-based game, I don't want to spoil the game's plot because I genuinely do want people to check this game out if they're interested. And if you already know how the game's plot goes, you might be more willing to just not actually play it. And I don't want that. Now, something I should also mention is that your choices actually do have some effect on the plot. This isn't like one of those telltale things where they say your choices matter, but then they almost never do, which is, you know, something people associate with this type of point and click game now. I have to say that that definitely helps adding replayability, which is crucial to a game like this that focuses primarily on narrative. Games that typically focus more on narrative than gameplay depth lack inherent replay value if you don't do this. And I prefer this approach to multiple endings over games like the original Life is Strange, where the ending is determined by a single choice you make at the tail end of the plot. And I understand that it's been several years since Life is Strange 1 came out, but I'm still not over how horribly that game ended. Moving on, I want to get something out of the way that I told myself I would say in this video. Do not, I repeat, do not play this game without installing the update patch. Because, who oh boy, is this game busted unpatched. I have footage of this game running without the patch. So many problems are here without the patch. Not only just frame rate drops, but just general chugging, texture pop-ins, as well as texture errors. The lip sync would go out of whack all the time, and sometimes audio would just not play, period. Especially sound effects. A lot of those were missing. And there was one instance where, like, the subtitles started clipping through the character models. And that was one of the most surreal glitches of all time, because I've never, ever seen that happen before. Of all things to clip, the subtitles. I looked up a video to see how the Switch port fared, because there is actually a Switch port of this game. It's apparently just as broken as the PS4 version. And looking into it, what I can find on Wikipedia, apparently this game accidentally released an unfinished build in Europe as well. So the game's initial release version was just a mess all around. This stuff sucks, obviously. But I don't want to be super hard on Pendulo, given this was their first fully 3D game, and they did release a patch to fix these various errors. So, after playing the game for about an hour, I decided to just be patient and let the update download before I continued playing, because I didn't want to judge the game based on its unpatched state from 2019, especially if there was a patch that supposedly fixed all these issues. So, after the updates are installed, does the game improve? Yeah, for the most part. See, upon installing the update, the game runs much better than it did beforehand. The frame rate is so much more consistent. The loading isn't super fast, but nowhere near as long as it was previously. Texture glitches and pop-ins are also basically non-existent once the patch is installed. At least on PS4. Again, the version I'm playing. I can't speak for Switch, Xbox, or PC, but I assume the patch did them some good as well. Especially PC, since that would probably be the main console that they'd want to focus on for a game like this. I will say the patch isn't perfect. Game still has some stuttering here or there, and there were multiple instances of pop-ins. The biggest issue, and this is after the update, mind you, is the game kept crashing. There were multiple instances of this game just crashing on me randomly. This is definitely worth noting, because there isn't even a consistent reason for the crashes that I could find. One time it happened when I was just going from the gym area to the diner area on the first section of the game. Another happened when I just tried entering John's patent pending brain blast mode. I think that's it for technical stuff, but I should go back into talking about something about the game. Like gameplay. So, question dear viewer. You ever play a Telltale game? Like, Walking Dead Onward Telltale game? Maybe a little bit of some of their earlier stuff like Back to the Future? This plays like that. You move the character around, observe things of interest, and solve simple puzzles. But like, not Professor Layden type puzzles, more like the stuff you'd find in like Life is Strange puzzles. Somewhere in between those two, that's where Black Sad lies. That's the area it works with. What's interesting is that this is, like I mentioned, the first time Pendulo's done a game using the Telltale approach. See, most of their previous games were more classic point and click. According to the Wikipedia page for this game, it was, this was done because they knew from the start that they wanted the game to come to consoles as well, and they wanted the gameplay to be more accessible to people on those platforms. Honestly, I'm okay with the choice they made, because John does feel nice to move. It does have his issues, though. Both I and my mother, who I played the game with, had to deal with multiple instances of having to reposition Mr. the Cat here so that he could properly look at something or observe it. Again, not a deal breaker, but it's worth mentioning it's not perfect movement. The only other things of note are John's senses and his thinking. 
I promise those are actual gameplay mechanics and not just things that exist. Remember earlier when I mentioned the brain blast? Well, that's a critical part of gameplay, like I er mentioned earlier. At several points, you'll have to piece together mental notes John took together and come to conclusions to advance the plots. Connecting thoughts together successfully will actually open up new paths of dialogue and will advance the main story in some instances. The gameplay section itself is pretty simple, but I like that it adds more player input into the mystery solving. If you remember the Scooby-Doo video, I wouldn't shut up about all the games and how they wouldn't make mystery solving an actual part of gameplay. So much so that I actually applauded titles like Scooby-Doo Unmasked, First Frights, and Spooky Swamp for actually having player input be a part of the mystery solving game. This game actually does that. It adds mystery solving gameplay mechanics that make you the player part of the mystery solving. And that's important for a game like this. Another thing is that at different points in the game, John can enter a black and white slow-mo mode where he can zoom in on stuff and analyze them more closely. His three senses, those being sight, hearing, and smell, are the main focus of these sections, and everything you analyze while in this mode will use one of these three senses. When it works, it works fine, but sometimes it just straight up wouldn't work. Unfortunately, the best example I have of it not working is a spoiler, so here's a spoiler. I'll have my editor put up a time code on screen so you can skip it. Okay, everyone good? All right, so basically you're in a hospital with Sonya who has come to see the hospitalized but still found alive Bobby Yale. You have to go into sense mode to notice that she's pulling a gun from her purse so John can stop her. This sounds simple, but the amount of times me and my mom got game overs in this one section is hilarious. It just did not want to work for her. It didn't want to work for me either, but eventually we just got it to work. Most of the time, the inconsistency isn't a major issue, but in this instance, it is an absolute major issue. Because this is a timed section. If you don't see the gun in time, you fail, get a game over, and that counts as a death. And if you're a trophy hunter, that's even worse because there's an entire trophy for not getting any more than nine game overs in a playthrough. This section in particular was annoying. Okay, spoilers are over. The last part of the gameplay that I want to mention, that I mentioned only briefly earlier, are the QTEs that are exceptionally frequent in this game. They basically exist for the fast paced sections, allowing action scenes to keep the player involved without completely changing the gameplay style. This is a trick that's been used in games of all types for years now. Using quick time events to keep players involved during action packed cutscenes is a common trope, not just in point and click games. Games like Bayonetta, Resident Evil 4, and God of War use these to keep players involved during these sections that would otherwise just be plain cutscenes. I mean, these sequences are fine. I grew up in the 2000s, so I've never really had anything against quick time events. They were just kind of a thing that existed. I don't love them, and I certainly don't enjoy how they're implemented in certain games, but they're fine usually. They're non-issues most of the time. They're fairly easy, and they don't usually bother me. Especially in a game like this, since they're not hard at all, and the few times I did lose to them was when I screwed up and hit the wrong direction or button, which happens to all of us. You guys are human, I'm a vampire, but we all make mistakes. Anyway, I only bring these up because they're a consistent part of gameplay, and I can't just pretend they're not here. Now that I've gotten all that out of the way, I should probably mention something just as important for a game this dialogue heavy. The voice acting. A lot of the actors in this game were in previous Pendulo games. Also hilariously, a bunch of them were in Detroit Become Human, especially John's voice actor, Barry Johnson. Barry's voice is one you're going to hear the most, given he plays the title lead of John Blacksat. At first, I was kind of caught off guard, because that's not the voice I originally envisioned for John when reading the comics. But by the end of the game, I was turned around completely and couldn't imagine Black Sad sounding any different. Overall, I think the vocal performances are fine. I didn't think anyone did a bad job and was never once taken out of the experiences by any of their performances, so I'd consider that a win. To follow tradition of a similar thing I did back in the Scooby video, I should also mention that Smirnoff, one of the many characters in the game, was played by David Coburn, who was Captain Planet. Yes, that Captain Planet. Moving right along from dialogue to presentation, since voice acting is a part of presentation, let's talk about how this game looks. Being based on a comic, translating that comic into not only a new medium, but a new visual style and dimension isn't easy. Wanjo's artwork for Black Sad is fantastic. I love everything about how the comics look. It's moody, it's expressive, it finds a way to make the anthro characters that look both human and animalistic at the same time. John, for example, can look more like a human with animal features in one shot, 
But then his expressions can shift into him being a total feral, aggressive feline. The lighting and atmosphere perfectly capture that film noir detective aesthetic that Black Sad is just drowning itself in and trying to invoke with every turn of the page. So, how does Pendulo's game hold up in that regard when compared to the source material? Personally, I think they do an alright job. The environments aren't hyper-realistic, and that's fine. The lighting is solid enough, the atmosphere does a good enough job trying to convey the film noir style that the comics capture. Yes, obviously I think the comics look better, but this is a solid effort. At first, I really didn't like the character models, they felt very budget to me, but as I played through the game, I started to warm up to how they looked. My favorite aspect of the character models is how half the time, John's face is one of pure smug amusement, which just radiates pure cat energy to me. It's clear this game isn't super high budget, but it still feels like Black Sad. My only major criticism is I feel like they never go hard with the facial expressions like the comics do. You never get a moment where John looks like a feral cat. You never get a moment where any of these characters really look more animal than human. They're kind of just relegated to human expressions for the vast majority of the game, and that's unfortunate. I don't think I have much else to say regarding the game without essentially going deep into the whole story, and my desire for people to check this game out means I don't want to talk about the story in more spoilery context. If you're into the Telltale style of adventure games, and you enjoy a good film noir detective story, then I'd say pick this game up. As I've mentioned previously, it's available for PS4, Xbox One, PC, and Nintendo Switch. Just remember to install all the patches before playing, otherwise you're gonna have to deal with a far more buggy and unpolished experience when compared to if you played it patched. Also, maybe try to get the game on a cheaper side. It's not bad or anything, it's a fine game. I just personally never want to spend $60 on a game that's more narrative focused than, than gameplay focused, given I usually play those games once every like handful of years. But this game's super easy to find cheap. I found my copy at a GameStop for around $15 and I'd say you can find that game pretty normally around that price in most stores. Although you might want to pick it up now, because depending on how the tides turn, at some point, I feel like this game might become like a cult classic and get super like overpriced and you don't want to end up with that. Plus, its digital price remains $60 at the moment, I believe. It goes on sale fairly often though. To end off this review, even if you're not interested in the game, I feel like you should check out the comics. Like I mentioned, you can pick up hardbacks on Amazon in English for relatively affordable prices considering the amount of comic you'd get with each issue. I only own one of these compilation books currently, but it's of really high quality, complete with nice pages that highlight the quality artwork and the nice look on my shelf. My grandmother even said she felt like she had to like open the book with gloves because of how nice the pages looked. Of course, as I've said before, these books contain plenty of mature themes and explicit stuff, so content warning there. It's not afraid to show just how upsetting and harsh the world can be and how horrible people can be sometimes. So discretion is very much advised if you go into the comic. Like I mentioned, the game doesn't really go as hard as the comic does, but it also doesn't shy away from these kind of things, so that's your second warning, just in case. Regardless, my hope of making this video is to highlight a game that I don't see anyone really talking about, made by a company that not a lot of people talk about either, based on a comic I don't see a lot of people talk about. Because I'm just a fan of highlighting stuff no one is doing the talking about. Hey, um, Dove? Hey, Barbara. What's happening? I hate to bother you, but we ran out of bottled water. How... how is that even possible? Calvin buys like a zillion bottles. He drinks water like he needs it to live. Um, he does need it to breathe, ma'am. Still, I can't go out and grab some. I'm doing something right now. Grab Emily and you two can go buy some more. Um, can I ask why I have to take Emily? Because she and I have a discount card at the only store that's open at night. Okay then, ma'am. Can I ask why I have to go too? Because if Emily goes alone, she'll buy more than what we need. Like how when you send her out to get a second PS4 controller and she bought 10 jugs of Sunny D and several bags of Bugles? Exactly! Good point. I'll get going. I have the castle to myself now. You know, since those two are gone, Calvin's out for his nightly swim, and Aquila's sleeping in her chambers. It's a shame I don't know what to do. Hmm, I should think on that.